Edge of Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone everywhere. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael, and for anyone just stumbling across the podcast for the very first time, or if you're new, let me tell you a little bit about it before we go on. Almost exactly a year ago from the release of this episode, I released the very first episode on August 1st, 2020. Boiled down to the most basic explanation, Texas History Lessons is my slow walk back through the history of Texas remembering things I had forgotten about, learning about some things I thought I knew that were a little bit off, and finding out that there are a lot of very cool, very important, very fun stories out there to learn. So as I do that, I share with you guys. I'm not here to make you change your beliefs. I'm not forcing an opinion. I'm trying not to. Everybody has biases. I try to keep mine to myself as much as possible. I'm just trying to find a balanced, detailed understanding of what things were like in the past to get closer to the reality as much as you can. And I'm not here to destroy anyone's heroes, as long as you don't mind to hear that your hero was a slave-trading shady land speculator that might have ended up in prison someday had he not died bravely fighting at the Alamo. Heck, one of my biggest childhood heroes was a depressive alcoholic who may or may not have also been a military genius. My point is, I intend to tell it like it is. You make the calls on who's a hero. That's not my job. I'm telling a story. I'm trying to share the facts as close as I can. It's when the interpretation and sharing of that where things get sometimes murky for people. No, my focus is on learning as much as I can about all the great things that happened in the history of Texas with as much attention, as I said, to the facts as I can get and sharing those stories of what makes Texas what it is. And I ask questions along the way. And someday we might get some answers. Like, what is Texas? Is Texas important? What does it mean to be a Texan? When do you become a Texan? What makes you a Texan? What is there anything special about Texas? And I don't really have answers to any of that. I have opinions, and I know a lot of you do too. And I've come across them on the internet. And a lot of people can't decide on what to agree about. Maybe we can come together to some understanding about what all those things mean. Now, as for structure, the backbone of the podcast are episodes that are lessons, which are set up just like a survey course on Texas history, except a lot slower. I take my time. I'm not rushing forward. Part one was on Texas before contact with Europe. We learned about the arrival of the first peoples thousands of years ago, and we learned about the nations that lived in Texas when Columbus set sail across the ocean, the Coaticans, the Karankawas, the Atacapans, the Humanos, the Tonkawas, the Caddo. And from time to time, we take breaks away from the lessons to learn about other stories, like the Galveston Hurricane of 1900, the Texas City Disaster, the First Dogs, where'd they come from, the career of Larry McMurtry, the New London Disaster, and more. And we also look at music, past and present. We've covered Billy Joe Shaver, we've covered modern music, Also, we've looked at Deep Ellum. It's part as an art center in Dallas. We also have a great episode where the host of the Wild West Extravaganza podcast, Josh, took over Texas History Lessons for an episode. And I went over to Wild West Extravaganza to try to fill his shoes. It was a lot of fun. Definitely check out both of them if you get a chance. Thanks, Josh, for doing that, by the way. And this episode is the beginning of a series of bonus episodes under the title of The Cattle Drives, The Life and Death of an Industry, while I work on Part 2, New Spain and Texas. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why take so long? Why not just get into it? We know what happened. Columbus sailed, Spanish came, Stephen F. Austin, Alamo, Texas. Boom, right? Nope. Yeah, well, no, that is a story. But that's big brush stroke history. I'm trying to get into the pointillism of it. I want to see the nitty gritty. I want to find the dirt. I want to breathe the air the best I can. I want to understand what it was like. How did you get to Texas in the first place if you were coming from Europe? 
How do the Anglos cross over? Where do they cross over? A lot of you know the answers to this. A lot of people don't know. I'm trying to find as much as I can out and make a, a comprehensive story, a narrative story that will flow that uh, can possibly be interesting to other people. I know it's interesting to me. That's why I do it. Now, I also know another thing you're thinking, some of you. I didn't mention the Comanches. I didn't mention the Apaches. And I didn't even mention the Wichita's, the Cherokees, the Delaware, the Shawnee, any of the other many tribes that have been in Texas. That's because we'll learn about them in part two. They almost all arrived in the area that we call Texas at about the same time that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And a lot came a lot later at the Pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. So for any new listeners, thanks for joining us. Hope you can stick with it. For those that have been with me for the past year, thank you even more. You're listening and reaching out to me and lending words of support have helped me stick with it and do a better job week after week. And I think I am getting better. At least that's my goal. I want to do a better job for myself and for everybody that's spending their time listening. Texas History Lessons is a work in progress, but the growing pains are over. The podcast is finding its stride, and the future looks pretty bright. So let's get to the cattle drives. I did this project, The Cattle Drives, The Birth and Death of an Industry, 1865 to 1890, as part of an economics history course a long while back. But I kind of think it will lend well to the podcast and it can be broken down into several episodes. So let's just get into it. I started out with two quotes, one fictional and one true, to kind of set the tone, if you will. The first is the character Will Anderson, portrayed by John Wayne in the movie from the early 70s, The Cowboys, one of my favorite movies Growing up, he said, you know, trail driving is no Sunday picnic. You got to figure you're dealing with the dumbest, orneriest critter on God's green earth. A cow's nothing but a lot of trouble tied up in a leather bag. Horse ain't much better. And I got to say, growing up on a farm with cattle and riding horses to round them up to work them. There's a lot of truth in that statement. The next quote is from a man named Jim Shaw who trailed cattle from Texas to Wyoming and he always objected to having his horses called ponies and his crew called boys. Hell, man, he said, they were horses and men. So that's how we introduced the subject of the cattle drives. So let's start with actual content. Perhaps no figure or era has captured the imaginations of Americans as much as the cowboy. He, without a doubt, stands out as one of the most romanticized images in American history. Literature, music, and film have all tried to convey his story. However, exaggeration and distortion of reality have often been the result. The cowboy and the cattleman played a vivid role in the late 19th century. During the two decades after the American Civil War, they carried out a massive transportation of cattle from Texas to northern ranges, expanding the cattle frontier to enormous proportions. The phenomena of the cattle drive, the long drive, covered only a brief time period. Despite brevity, much was accomplished as enterprising businessmen adapted to find a way to connect an enormous supply with a growing demand. This study, meager and flawed as it is, seeks to touch upon the reality behind the romance. The people of Texas have almost always been involved with raising cattle. From the early Spanish explorers and colonists to the Anglo-American settlers of the 1820s, cattle played some part in their lives and economy. The cattle population grew to the millions. In fact, at the end of the Civil War, which left the state demoralized and economically ill, many of these cattle were unowned, wild, and dangerous, roaming across the range. They offer the Texans no immediate economic relief due to their isolation from markets. For every cattle raiser to drive his herd every year to the market of the northern railroads in Kansas would have been absurd, as well as economically destructive. Some could and did do this, to be sure, but most ranchers relied upon the emergence of a new entrepreneurial class of men, the trail contractors. 
they filled the vacuum between the market of the Northern Railroads and the vast supply of cattle in Texas. Actually, many contractors speculated in the cattle industry by purchasing cattle from ranchers and then trailing them north. This, in effect, created a local market for many ranchers. Jimmy Skaggs, an economic historian, calls the cattle trailing contractors of the post-Civil War era hip pocket businessmen who, quote, fill an economic vacuum between supply and demand by supplying slaughter beeves for the American red meat industry. The cattlemen faced great risk financially as well as physically, as was to be expected in such a raw market-oriented economy existing On the frontier, some became very rich while others lost everything. Many of the contractors later settled down to ranching, succeeding and failing just as they had in the cattle driving industry. The activities of these men influenced the frontier development and fueled the frontier economies. The drives had great impact on the cattle towns at the end of the trail and several sites along the trail, especially at the Red River crossings. The cattle drives also provided employment for thousands of men following the Civil War. They were responsible for moving probably more than 6 million cattle between 1866 and 1890. This project seeks to explore the economic and historical aspects of this era. To tell the story of the cattle drives is to involve oneself in the history of the westward movement. As Edward Everett Dale wrote, Any history of the ranch cattle industry of the Great Plains region is merely a part of the history of a much larger movement, that of the settlement and development of the American wilderness. Now's a good time to take a small break to thank Age of Radio for hosting Texas History Lessons. And we'll be right back. Now let's get into a little bit of background information here. In 1783, the United States, composed of the original 13 colonies and the land up to the Mississippi River, possessed a total of nearly 889,000 square miles. By 1865, the land area of the United States covered over 3 million square miles. This expansion to almost 2 billion acres of territory resulted from a series of acquisitions between 1803 and 1853. The Louisiana Purchase in 1803, Florida 1819, the annexation of Texas in 1845, Settlement of the Oregon Country Border Dispute in 1846, the Mexican Session of 1848, and the Gadsden Purchase of 1853. Two-thirds of the land was still in the public domain. Along with this territorial expansion ran parallel to a population growth in the United States. There was also a significant migration of the United States population preceding the expansion. The population was rural. In 1800, the population of the United States was about 5.2 million persons. 4.9 million of this total lived in the area of the original 13 colonies. In 1840, the population equaled 16.9 million persons. 10.6 million lived in the area of the original 13 colonies. Out of a population of over 31 million in 1860, only 16 million lived in the original colonies. This means that nearly half of the population lived in areas containing only negligible numbers in 1800 and even 1820. Just over 19% of the people lived in urban areas. 80% of Americans were rural. Jonathan Hughes, in his Economic History of the United States, describes the situation well. It was the farmers who occupied the continent and brought it into production, whose needs created the demand for industry, towns, cities, finance, and transportation networks and whose output fed the rising urban masses. By 1850, farmers still numbered 85% of the population. By 1850, nearly 37% of the southern population was slave. In the north, by then, the number of slaves was negligible. After the invention of Whitney's Gin in 1793 and the penetration by southern planters into Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, and East Texas, Cotton culture had given the slave South a greatly expandable money crop in addition to sugar production. The first English colonists settling on the Atlantic seaboard naturally brought cattle with them. The cattle raisers lived on the extreme edge of settlement, needing abundant pasture for grazing. The ranching area occupied a narrow edge of the frontier. One of the battles of the revolution was named for one of the cow pens in this fringe area. These cattle raisers operated on a small scale, not spreading too far away from the centers of civilization. The threat of Indian attack 
along with the need to remain close to the population centers which provided markets, were the two factors necessitating this characteristic. Following the Civil War, this fringe area erupted westward, and the area in which cattle were raised grew to be larger than the cultivated lands of the United States. What facilitated this explosion was the driving of cattle from Texas. Edward Everett Dale, to quote him again, said, Any history of the cattle industry in the West must begin with Texas, since that state was the original home of ranching on a large scale in the United States, and from its vast herds were drawn most of the cattle for the first stocking of the Central and Northern Plains. As the Spanish explorers and colonizers entered the Mexico and the Southwest, Moorish horses and Andalusian cattle came with them. Everett Dick, a historian, wrote, As the Spanish settlements pushed northward, cattle raising naturally moved along the outer edges of settlement. Some of the horses and cattle escaped from their owners, and from them grew the herds of wild horses and cattle on the plains. I'd like to add here that the cattle that the Spanish brought with them when they settled the missions of Presidios in Texas were essential to the development of a ranching industry, the foundation of a ranching industry that was the basis for it in Texas. The Tejanos had established a ranching culture long before the Anglos ever came. And we're going to get a lot more detail and in, look into this when we get into Spanish Texas, when we get to the lesson soon. So we'll continue on here. The first Anglo settlers of Texas were usually cotton farmers rather than livestock raisers. They did bring cattle with them to su supplement their activities. In fact, the liberal land grant policy of Spain and later Mexico established a land system beneficial to cattle raising. The Anglo settlers' cattle mixed with the Spanish breed yet made little impact on the longhorned beasts. The mixture of the Kentucky saddle horses of the Anglos with the Spanish breed resulted in a horse that had endurance, yet was swift as well. Texas entered the Union in 1845 as a state. There were about 200,000 white settlers and about 35,000 slaves at this time. By 1861, when Texas succeeded, there were more than 450,000 white settlers and 182,000 slaves. The Americans were settled mostly east of the Pecos River and south of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. As stated before, the majority worked on cotton plantations, but many also worked with cattle. Some estimates say that there was at least 4 million head of cattle in the Texas range. Almost all were longhorns, the descendants of the Spanish Andalusian and Castilian cattle. To the west of the Nueces River, most ranchers employed vaqueros rather than using slaves as cowhands. The vaqueros were highly skilled with the rope and the branding iron. East of the Nueces River, vaqueros taught other hands how to operate in thick coastal brush. The cattle east of the Nueces were very wild and the land was bleak and rough. In 1847, Samuel A. Maverick, a lawyer, received 400 head of cattle in payment for a debt. Maverick entrusted the cattle to the care, as the story goes, to somebody. And they lived with his family on the San Antonio River. But he didn't go about to getting the cattle branded. The cattle, roaming free, scattered across the range. Maverick sold the cattle, his land, and the brand to A. Toutant Beauregard, brother to the famous Confederate general in 1856. By this time, the cattle were widely scattered. Beauregard sent his men searching to gather the cattle, covering several counties. Beauregard's men claimed any unbranded cattle that they found as one of Mavericks. Eventually, any unbranded cattle wandering on the range came to be referred to as Mavericks. The cowboys were in a profession where skill and economic necessity often outweigh the color of a man's skin. During the early days, black cowboys were very numerous in East Texas, especially between the Trinity River and the Louisiana border. Before the Civil War, several free black men worked as cattlemen in East Texas. Some did quite well for themselves. For example, there lived in Orange and Jefferson counties in 1850 a free black man named Aaron Ashworth. He owned the largest herd, 2,570 head in the area. Ashworth also owned slaves and hired a white schoolmaster to teach his four children. He came to Texas in 1833 
having received a claim for land from the Mexican government. Following independence, the Republic of Texas ordered all free black men to leave the country. However, several of Ashworth's neighbors interceded with the government for Ashworth. Ashworth and his two brothers were allowed to stay. A special act of the Texas Congress later confirmed Ashworth and other free men's ownership of land. Such allowances display the sex and respectability of men such as Aaron Ashworth had attained in the cattle business. The cattle had very little value in Texas since they were almost isolated from larger markets. And at this point, we're going to wrap it up for this episode. I think that does nicely for an introduction. We've shown where the cattle came from, the growth of the nation, and are getting to the point where we're going to get to the origins of the long drive, which we'll take up in the next episode. I want to thank Ron, Jay, Kay, Brenda, Tim, Josh, and Johnny for supporting the show on Patreon. Their support means a lot, and I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody listening. A lot of new people have found the show recently, and I owe a lot of that to Josh coming over and bringing some of his listeners, I think. And if you will, remember to go check out Mondo Salas and his music wherever you listen to music. He's been working on a new album, so go check out his website at rosemond.com and follow him on Twitter and everywhere else for show announcements. And I'm going to end the show with a song that he shared with me for the last episode. It's an unreleased tune called Old Dogs, and it's amazing, which means that the next album is going to be something to look forward to. Thanks again for listening. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, be kind, and we'll see you next time on Texas History Lessons. Adios. It's the water in the river's word to dry. Would you take me in the worthy eye? The angels hardly made it. There's never been nobody And we keep trying to live But all we find Is hard times And old dogs The day these old dogs quit Sometimes I've been bearing the miles without giving in For you I'll go until my I don't